you, Salome. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Georgian Institute of Politics. I'm the head of this institute. I'm happy to see that this conference has become a tradition. It is the sixth conference of this kind. Uh, and these issues are mainly dedicated to the issues of democracy in Georgia. These are matters related to Georgia as well. This conference was being held uh, live. We had more participants, of course, and it can be said that uh, it found its own place in the Georgian reality. But because of the epidemic, of course, for almost two years, we moved our traditional conferences to online, and the conference that usually takes one day is divided into three parts. Today we will have the first part, and we will of course have the second and the third panels. Uh, a little later in the next week, and we'll give you information about that too. First of all, I would like to thank our speakers for participating in this event. I would like to thank our participants. I would like to specifically thank Professor Julia George to participate in this panel. This is a challenge for her too, because right now it's early morning in America, and we do appreciate her efforts. I would like to thank Ned for traditional support. In this limit, we conduct not only conferences, but we traditionally prepare compendiums so of different uh, political documents. This year is no exception. We prepared four pol policy documents, which will be uploaded in our chart, both in Georgian and English languages, so you will be able to read those. These policy papers are related to topics which are quite important for Georgia in terms of democracy research and study. They are related to party elections, democracy and democratization. As to our um, today's topic, you know that the issue that is uh, pressing today is elections, and therefore one of the goals of this panel was to have a certain discussion about why in the last 30 years Georgia fails to have fair elections. This is a rhetorical question, it may be said. It's quite a difficult question too. And we hope that we will at least start a discussion and we will facilitate somehow this discussion and shed light on the topic. I'm sure that we will have very interesting opinions heard. We have diverse panelists here, and I'm sure that we will have a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much again, and I wish you a very fruitful panel. Now I would like to pass floor to Ms. Gia Nordia, the moderator of this panel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. In a Zoom world, where we leave for more than a year, the conference means a completely different thing. I'm a moderator, but I have no idea where panelists are. I know now from Cornelia and Miss Julie George is in America. Hello to her, but I have no idea about the others, and it basically doesn't matter. But if somebody wonders, I myself am in Belize. We were used to the fact that conferences could last a day, two or three, and now we have a conference that is divided uh, into a fortnight, actually, and we will have a second panel, not after the coffee break, but in a week on Ju uh, June 2 at 5 o'clock in the evening Jordan time. And we will speak about the reliability of uh, public opinion polls. It is a very interesting topic indeed. But today, we 
will talk about the elections and how how much we trust them. So we do not trust the polls, but we do not trust and have no confidence in our elections either. So on the one hand, we want to have elections that are trustworthy and reliable, credible, and we also want to know in what conditions or when and how people would trust the elections and the results of these elections where people would say that indeed the governments are elected by the public vote and not through some machineries or mechanisms or whatever. And the most recent, recent elections showed that we didn't reach this benchmark. Uh, it is the it is not a new problem for Georgia actually. I do not recall any elections where the uh, losing parties would admit to their loss loss and say that yes, people elected the other party, say or other parties. And the reason is that actually all political parties and people in general, they do have grounds for uh, suspicion and for really distrusting the results of elections. So it is an acute problem. So let me move to our speakers. We will have four speakers in this panel. I must ask them to limit themselves to eight, eight minutes, maximum of 10. I would forgive them for 10 minutes, but nothing beyond that, please. And I would like to give floor to Miss Julie George, our old friend, professor from America, who studies Georgian and Georgian policy and political environment for years, especially elections dynamics. And it will be really interesting to see and to hear her opinion as, you know, the external opinion about Georgia. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Batonogia. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm so happy to be here this morning. Well, for me, it's morning for you. I guess it's later uh, with such esteemed panelists. I'd also like to congratulate um, all the Georgians on their Independence Day yesterday. Um, I hope it was a good holiday. All of the pictures on my Facebook say that it uh, was quite an event. Um, I, I, we, we were given a series of questions to respond to, uh, and I'm not going to respond to all of those questions, uh, but I've been asked, we were asked uh, why Georgia keeps failing at registering free, fair, and competitive elections, and what institutional changes might be taken, and what are the sources of distrust inside Georgian politics. So these are the focal points um, of my presentation today. I think what I'd like to start out by saying is that uh, while uh, Batono Corneli and Batono Guia's comments at the beginning um, focus on attention and an urgency in Georgian politics, that uh, these processes are quite normal uh, and they're quite normal even in quite established democracies. All of you know uh, the American controversies about our own elections and our distrust in our own elections. And I think an important lesson to take uh, from this experience, from the American experience is that creating competitive democratic elections that are accountable to a population is very, very hard and they're hard to maintain. Um, even um, for those who've had 200 years of practice. The important, for me, understanding elections and the emergence of democratic elections that are, that are actually competitive and actually accountable and fairly run is to understand basically to take an economic principle of supply and demand. And keep in mind that the entire system of democracy to run is based on contradictory pressures. The primary pressure that fuels uh, and animates the momentum of democratic governance through elections is the ruling power's determination to stay in power. Um, 
only through that determination to stay in power do you have the incentive structure for the leadership of a state to be accountable to their population. They want to win elections, so they try to become accountable to the needs of the population through policymaking so that they can win again. This impulse, this urgency is the entire, uh, creates the momentum for democratic governance. So it's not surprising then that a party that stays in power will try whatever they can do to stay in power. That is the underlying assumption of democracy. It is also the underlying assumption of authoritarian regimes. But I think a good starting point is to understand that the, the urgency and the momentum for governance inside any system is the desire for power. What democracies do is they institutionalize that desire and they put constraints on it. Now, there are two ways to do this. One is through self-restraint of the political leadership, which is always suspect and always unlikely because the political leadership always presumes that they should stay in power. The alternative are institutions, of course. And so what we observe in Georgia is the emergence of institutions. Now, the institutions don't emerge because of goodness or morality or some sort of even European value. Right? We learn as much about authoritarian regimes by studying Europe as we understand about democratic regimes. So these are not necessarily cultural or moral, uh, morally implemented or motivated. Rather, it's done by constraint. And so what institutions do is they provide the constraints um, in order to create incentives for a ruling party once they lose an election to leave because generally it's the ruling party that is empowered to alter the circumstances of electoral governance or administrating um, elections. So these are not probably not particularly surprising points for you. In political science, what we look at is we look at the circumstances through which power sharing emerges, through which the ruling leaders are restrained functionally um, from grabbing power and stepping, and rather stepping back from power to allow um, an opposition power to take force. This is why we know, this is when we know democracy is taking hold. So institutions are obviously the answer, but in Georgia, we've been here before. Um, Georgia is, is striking um, amongst the countries of the former Soviet Union for its commitment um, and its thinking about creating institutions for democratic governance. Uh, so these are familiar grounds and, and it's good that they are familiar grounds because with iteration, of course, you develop better institutions and better pathways for that institutionalization uh, to maintain among the leaders. From where I sit as someone who's been watching Georgian elections for a long time, um, I think the most important thing that needs to be done is that Georgians uh, and the Georgian electorate and the Georgian political conversation needs to lower the stakes of losing an election. The reason why ruling parties accept electoral results that push them out of power is that they have an opportunity to come back in power again. Uh, for, the law, for, for the first decade of its experience, the experience of Georgia was zero sum. That is that once a party was removed from power, it could not come back. I'm doing a current study on uh, the Rose Revolution, actually ancient history um, for all of, all of you. And it's, it's striking just how quickly the CUG party um, dropped out of power. What's interesting with the UNM's losses in 2012 and 2013 is actually we have now a precedent for a ruling party stepping out, losing the election, stepping outside of power and maintaining some sort of political legitimacy and political conversation in the framework. Uh, I think this is a very important example, um, but it is more important actually uh, to repeat it. I think that other underlying problems though still have emerged. Um, the 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 norm or the practice inside Georgian um, civil service institutions to have partisanship inside the civil service means that losing an election has extraordinary and unacceptable consequences for more than just the ruling party, but for actually an entire experience, um, an, an entire cohort of individuals who have vested interests in winning. I think dismantling that partisanship structure is the first step to making the elections less, less important, less existential, less 
uh, less disempowering for political actors. Because of course, if they have to leave, leave power, people will, uh, will establish and, and pursue the status quo. And if that is their only opportunity to, to bring their, their policy vision, right, which motivates many political actors, uh, then losing that power will dismantle that vision um, and, and therefore dismantle their political futures. And I think stepping away from any system that creates uh, and sustains that practice is, is, is important. I think for, for hybrid and authoritarian regimes, uh, the fundamental uh, mechanism of governance and maintaining power for many leaders um, are, are patterns of corruption and patronage uh, that are created in science systems. Uh, special favors for uh, licenses and regulations for economic development of uh, other sorts of, of uh, a kind of back channel access uh, to money and to power. Uh, when a new leadership comes into power, the urgency for dismantling those systems of corruption seem overwhelming. But it also raises the stakes of losing an election. I think that in, in recent Georgian politics, uh, both after the Rose Revolution and then after uh, the election of 2012 and 2013 and shifts of power, every single electoral shift in power in Georgia or every single shift in power, whether electoral or not in Georgia, has been accompanied by anti-corruption reforms that dismantle a political opposition. This is a this is a struggle, right? In the U.S. right now, we're having this conversation um, about uh, about Donald Trump's many cases against him. I think it's important to showcase institutional vigor uh, and care and restraint in pursuing justice against people who've been corrupted while in office, and understand that those are systemic factors as well as individual ones uh, that need to be overcome. Um, without raising the stakes of losing an election. This is the hardest thing. Finally, some last points in my, uh, I've, I'm almost at 10 minutes in my last 40 seconds. External pressures are not the answer. External, external actors are waiting for Georgians to find their own supply and demand equilibrium for the population to demand a democratic supply from its leadership. The West doesn't want to do this and they will leave as soon as they can. The ways to find these things internally is to recognize that democracy is not a value, it's a process. And that all members in society, whether on the conservative side, um, on the populist side, or on the reform side or progressive side, or however the, the ideological frameworks are divided, have an interest in this process because all should have a path to power. Uh, the, the, the partisanship, the zero sum, the side taking that is moralized and creates moral high grounds through a partisan process will only create this winner, uh, this zero sum balance between the winners and losers. For Georgia, I think to go forward into democracy, all members of the political society need to value the process more, not just in terms of voice, but in terms of actual experience of empowerment. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. Um, I look forward to everybody else's contributions. Thanks a lot, Julie. Uh, so now I move to Ketevan Bulkwadze, who is assistant professor in University of Lund, uh, Sweden. And she will have her eight to 10 minutes now. Please, Ketevan. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to take part in this very timely event and also incredibly important topic, something that almost never loses relevance, unfortunately. Um, my points will be very much related to what Julie just described. Um, so in some way, it will be a bit of a reiteration. Um, so when we talk about the, the failed or irregular election cycles in Georgia and potential um, solutions to it, I think first we need to get at the core of the problem, which I think is the basically incentive structures of the political parties, right? And Julie has already touched upon this, but I will again continue delving deeper into this angle of the problem. Because essentially what happens both before, during and after the elections is the reflection of the party's um, very short uh, term incentive structures, something that is currently not conducive to them making long-term commitments. So if we go back to the, you know, 
key questions of what distinguishes parties in established democracies from those in, in electoral democracies or hybrid regimes or semi-authoritarian, whatever we call it, uh, that have essentially left the phase of authoritarianism but have not um, yet consolidated into democracy. And the key distinguishing feature is essentially mutual guarantees or credible commitments, right? In democracies, politicians abide by the rules of competition, or at least we expect them. There are, of course, deviations, as Julie has mentioned, and we've seen that also in, in many of the uh, Central European countries, right? But essentially, the they, they all have, uh, parties have guarantees that their rights will be protected irrespective of uh, who loses elections. So the uncertainty of this democratic competition is mitigated by the certainty of uh, mutual guarantees. But in hybrid regimes, formerly democratic institutions essentially coexist with uh, authoritarian governance practices, which hollow out uh, these institutions. And as a result, they are not uh, able to guarantee uh, basic credible commitments. Um, instead, the parties are facing uh, what Shedler calls uh, unbounded uncertainty, right? A condition under which actors face this constant risk that the rules of the game and the structure of the political interaction will change in the subsequent rounds. So even established democracies, there is uncertainty about who is going to win the elections. In hybrid regimes, there is uncertainty about what's going to happen to the party if they lose the elections. So they either completely disappear from the uh, political arena, something that um, unfortunately we've seen a lot in Georgia, right? And most uh, famous example, for instance, um, uh, Shevardnadze's Citizens Union, which essentially uh, withered just weeks after its leader lost power, or often become targets of uh, intimidation by the new party of power, right? The dominant party. And unfortunately, something that's, again, we've seen a lot, especially in the, in the last few years, but I would say, pretty much 20, last 20 years of Georgian history. Um, and this also creates the vicious cycle because parties that have targeted others implicitly know that they will become the new targets of prosecution when they're out of power. So this uncertainty of what's going to happen to them has huge implications for how they approach the elections, right? Elections become race that they cannot afford to lose. Um, and this fear of being out of office also shortens um, their time horizons and makes the uh, dominant parties desperately clinch to power and politicize public resources, abuse the administrative resources, something that is very much recurrent in Georgia, but also in other post-Soviet states. And on the other hand, the competing parties to engage in predatory behavior and plunder uh, public resources for uh, private enrichment. And this is something that we've seen a lot in, for instance, Ukraine and Moldova, where maybe competition was um, much more intense, but it did not translate into um, uh, fair elections, right? Instead, we've seen that the ruling parties, uh, basically realizing that they would lose power, emptied the state treasury. Uh, we've seen that just before the elections in uh, Moldova, 1 billion euros, basically in 2014, just disappeared. Uh, similarly, Yanukovych left the uh, state coffers empty when he left. So this uncertainty really distorts their uh, incentive structures. Um, and I think when we talk about the potential solutions, the first step should be to, to look at the lessons that we could draw from the new democracies that were in a similar position as Georgia, but managed to transition into democracy, right? As, that are now labeled as at least new democracies. Now, the conventional literature in political science holds that uh, competitive elections are good not only in their own right, but because it forces the parties to think about the protection of their interests outside of their tenure. And the logic behind this is that the ruling elites in danger of losing office fear finding themselves on the receiving end of the politicized justice, politicized bureaucracy, politicized police, right? And these fears then should prompt them to insulate these institutions from political uh, pressure to protect themselves from future intimidation. They, for instance, depoliticize courts as a form of insurance today to avoid facing politicized courts tomorrow when in opposition, right? And again, we've seen this logic play out um, in many young democracies, most uh, famous example being, for instance, 
um, PRI in Mexico, right, which very much resembled the dominant uh, parties that we've seen uh, in Georgia abusing um, state administrative resources. But when they realized that they were about to lose power, they they delegated tons of uh, powers to, uh, to 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 make the courts independent because they were afraid they would face this uh, these courts. However, there's one crucial uh, scope condition, right? And that is that the parties should expect to survive in opposition to think about their long-term insurance. Right now, parties in Georgia and uh, most of the post-Soviet states are not thinking in terms of long-term insurance. Right now, they have short time horizons and they, on the one hand, abuse institutions for uh, partisan purposes or private enrichment. So to reap the benefits of competitive elections, I think um, Western donors and partners, as well as local activists, need to sort of facilitate these mutual guarantees and, and elite pacts that the winner will not go against and destroy whoever will end up in opposition. We've seen recently EU's um, attempt to, for instance, mitigate right, this opposition harassment with a UNM leader. Um, and I think this is the avenue that the Western partners should continue working with. And I agree with Julie that conditionality and Western pressure may be not long-term answer, but unfortunately, given the current situation, I think it's, it's at least short-term stimuli to, to start the process and create the, the, the sort of incentive structures for the, for the parties. Um, I think if, if existing party, if, if GD, for instance, uh, knows that they will not be prosecuted in opposition, chances are a little bit higher that they might accept defeat when they realize that their political, um, their popular support dwindles, right? They have essentially two options, right? They, they can either completely rig the elections and go down the alley of Lukashenko, and on the other hand, you know, accept, um, accept the defeat because they know that they will survive in opposition and it mitigates the risks of losing. And this, I think, also has the potential to turn the vicious cycle into virtuous cycle because when parties realize we're going to stay in this game over a long haul, that's when they start uh, thinking about sort of, you know, self-centered or even egoistic benefits of depoliticized institutions, which are there to actually protect them. So I would say that this is more of an elite-focused solution, but it also needs to be, of course, accompanied by a more structural um, solution, which, which would be to focus on the grassroots uh, dimension of the parties. And this is something that Levant will probably talk much more about because he has a lot of expertise on that. But of course, the key problem in Georgia is that the parties are not built around societal cleavages or ideologies, but around basically big men uh, and oligarchs, right? Right now, they are vehicles for their parties to participate in parliamentary elections and to reap the economic benefits that are associated with holding political office. So more work uh, needs to be done in terms of uh, strengthening internal party democracy uh, and to embed the parties in the grassroots causes, right? Access to leadership positions, for instance, in the party should be through elections. Uh, nomination of candidates for elections must involve a defined selectorate and not be limited to the preferences of, um, of a single leader. This is, of course, a very uh, long-term solution, and we should not be naive that this can be done in a couple of years. But I think if, if both external actors and local civil society activists uh, continue working along these two dimensions, on the one hand, facilitating the mutual guarantees, and on the other hand, uh, strengthening the internal party democracy, I think we will eventually witness uh, elections which are both free and fair, unlike the elections which are right now free, but very much unfair. I'll stop here, and I'm uh, very much looking forward to hearing more pan other panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ketevan. We have two more presentations to hear. But before I move to the next panelist, I want to remind our participants that after these four presentations, we'll start a Q&A session. And therefore, you can ask your questions in writing and use chat or q and a function here so you can use both options for writing down your questions and uh, 
And uh, I think, you know, considering our format, it's better to ask questions in, in writing. So if you have questions already, you can start writing them. If you have questions to our two speakers that you heard already, or you will have questions for Jabber or others, you may not wait at the end of this panel, but uh, write down your questions. Now I would like to pass floor to Levan. Who represents the CMT, the organization that helps uh, not only in Georgia, but helps development of political parties in some countries of Eastern Europe. So let's give him the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Nordia, Mr. Corneli, to the Georgia Institute of Politics. I congratulate you on this idea of uh, holding conferences like this. It's a very interesting forum every year, and I, it is my pleasure to participate in this conference. So I'm asked to discuss one specific issue, which I think is key to uh, holding democratic and fair elections. This is administration of election processes. And I will try to share my personal opinion and our um, opinion about that. I will try to speak about what problems I see and how these problems can be resolved. You know that, uh, and uh, Mr. Nodia mentioned it in his in intro, it's about the distrust in uh, these processes. I think that Georgia can share experience of its own and uh, mainly negative uh, experience of administration of elections, and it can also learn from experience of other countries. I see several problems to why we don't trust the election and election processes in general, and why is it so difficult to admit to loss um, as a result of elections. First, and primary, I think, is that the elections administration is accountable to the ruling party. So it's just one body that it is sort of accountable to. So it's like one party rules, governs this elections commission despite the process of selecting people to the Central Elections Commissions. Uh, we know that there are different options. We know that different political parties who can effectively, um, effectively say, ruin or disturb trust in the elections commission or the election processes. Plus, you know, there are very low requirements towards the incumbents uh, to membership in the elections commission. And um, the people who want to work at the Central Election Commissions, so, uh, if they are invited to an interview, they may not even go because there is no requirement to do so. And now there is very low remuneration of people, especially at the level of regions. The remuneration is approximately 1,000 lari, uh, and even lower at the rural area uh, level, etc. And these people are basically in the front line always. And our election processes are like battles and war fronts. So uh, their remuneration is very low, and it's very difficult to expect or to require them to, you know, to do more um, 
for the for the money that they receive and for the perspectives that they may have in the long run. Also, it is quite important, in addition to non-political candidates, people should be uh, selected and uh, appointed uh, for their professional uh, merits. In addition, the commission members change very often right before elections, so the law changes very frequently. And, uh, a lot of people need to be trained so that they are picked and recruited and then administer elections, etc. And therefore, you know, um, some questioning their trades or um, distrust, etc. You know, uh, political parties really raise questions about the, the level of the uh, Elections Commission um, staff. Um, and another very big problem is accountability. And we have the mechanism which doesn't really work effectively because people who are nominated by political parties, they are not accountable to anyone on anything. And they are not accountable before the chair of the Elections Committee or the Commission itself or the political party that nominated them. But so they can absolutely on their own adopt their own decisions, will it be fair or unfair, and nobody will be hold them accountable. Um, including the head of the Elections Commission. So I've listed these problems. They are quite serious and they Re require solutions, in my opinion. So what can be done? And I can list here six principles of how to tackle these problems and how can it be resolved in case the political will is there. So first of all, we have to really face the truth and admit that this collegial system, this collective system that exists in the Central Elections Commission, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work for reasons that I've listed above. And there are some negative motives that all political parties have who are not happy with the outcomes of elections. So there are two good solutions, one better than the other. One is that the elections administration shall be absolutely separated from the political party's control. So the story, the, the history in our country shows that the political parties fail to lead these elections, uh, uh, elections body, and Therefore, they have to separate themselves from any influence and any impact of political parties. So political parties shall leave actually uh, these elections commissions alone and they need to be happy with the role of a watchdog. Um, I think they have to be content with that, I think. And it is very important to professionalize our elections commission so that we have people there who are not linked to any political parties, that they have to be independent professionals, professionals of elections and the law on elections, so that they do not run and somehow, you know, do not facilitate and promote each of their political party while working at the election, Elections Commission. Also, it is quite important for the staff to be accountable uh, before the Central Elections Commission, because currently we have a very ineffective or bow practice, I would say, in uh, and uh, not a very effective model uh, of uh, administering this uh, Missions at uh, every level, and uh, the this election staff they should be accountable to the Central Election Commission. And a very good example here is the Public Ombudsman's Office. Although Public uh, Ombudsman is actually appointed by majority of the Parliament, 
Here we see that this institution is more effective than the collective uh, body uh, or the institution of this Central Elections Commission. And public comportment um, is more trustworthy. People uh, consider it as a credible institution, a very reliable institution. Also, I think that elections processes shall be automated where it is possible, uh, which will reduce the space for interpretation of results and outcomes and votes, etc. Many decisions shall be like automated with clear, transparent terms, conditions, etc. And that is not the case today. Introduction of new technologies is absolutely important and crucial, I'd say. There are many questions, a lot of criticism about election technologies like digital technologies and use of them in elections. But I think that, for instance, counting uh, ballots should be automated as much as possible. And surely this paper trail shall be there, of course, as well. Uh, another key issue, and unfortunately, it has never had sufficient intention in political debates, the reform that has been prepared for today is basically based on this collective uh, version and they just introduce different proportions. But I think that we need more radical solutions to this problem because even with this model that is under review today, we will still, you know, face the same problems that we faced uh, during last elections. The consensus, I think, shall be imposed on political parties in issues like uh, the election of the chair of the elections commission, a staffing of the commission, etc. I think we can use some more innovative approaches to that. We've recently prepared uh, some recommendations which says that they should start with this double approval so that the majority of majority shall support as well as the majority of minorities. And so it will be some sort of double approval. And uh, I think it will sort of lead these uh, parties to more consensus and the last thing, and then I will end not to um, abuse my time frames. I think that we need to introduce the system based on the elections professionals. I think we have to appoint one person who will be the ruler, so to say, of this election processes in Georgia. Just for comparison, uh, the Canada elections are led by one person. India elections are led by one person, and this person then appoints two more, and during elections, he or she uh, can take decisions like uh, use of police forces, etc. So we don't need the uh, elections commission comprising 12 people who fail to uh, be effective and who fails even to, uh, to, to govern and manage their people, the staff. I think that these things would help us in having healthier elections process and the healthier elections administration. Thank you. The last speaker now, Jabba Devdariani, who is the analyst. And he, he represents the civil G, a very popular source, the web page containing information about different political processes in Georgia. 
Thank you. It is very pleasant to be here. Thank you, the Georgian Institute of Politics, for inviting me to speak uh, on this topic before you. I actually want to follow the conversation that Levan had started, and I want to abstract from this topic. And I would suggest, and let's think. Ms. George said that democracy is a process, and elections and trust in elections is not frozen in time either. And uh, we say that trust in elections is very low in our country. But again, based on based on experiences and things that we observe throughout years, I have an impression that we still have dynamics uh, in the uh, elections process. First, we didn't trust the elections at all. Then we had some reforms and this trust has increased. And now we are at the next stage when this trust again diminishes and reduces. So at least this is my perception. And therefore, probably we have to think what is the reason for these dynamics. And I think here are two things that we have to separate from each other. One is the uh, technical issues of administering elections, where we can improve certain things like the list of voters uh, uh, or uh, recruiting and appointing some professionals to uh, elections administration. And uh, another is the exception where the trust in, uh, in elections have not increased. So let's ask a question. In what cases and what instances people of Georgia trust the elections and the outcomes? And the answer is that basically almost, almost never, because they all think that it is all decided in advance and uh, everybody knows who will win the elections. And, and then people are ready to act, maybe, you know, to protest or something else, although this is a different matter and let's put it aside, put it aside uh, and let's try and answer this question. So why don't we trust elections in general? And probably here we, go to things that Levan has discussed. And it's an affair broker, the issue of fair broker. So who we whom we trust as an institution or personally who can who can resolve the conflict situation where political parties are rivals, they compete with each other, and then there should be somebody who can, who shall say who is the winner and the loser. I think that in the democratic systems, we have two options. In the non-democratic, it can be a fair king, but, you know, but the second, in democracy can be two things, in my opinion. One is the civil service or civil administration, and second is unity of citizens, citizens as holders of rights. And how can these two elements be included to increase trust in the election system? Trusting in the administration, the civil service, depends on recognizing two things. One is that we have the administration that serves this the state and not the political party. The state that and that it acts based on the laws. I am here introduced as the founder of the Civil G, but I also actively work 
on various public institutions reforms. So separating administration, the independent agency and the political party, the, the separating these two is very weak uh, in, in, in our people. And the ruling party somehow always think that the public services are just their continuation and it shouldn't be like this. And um, internal uh, service in the public service also show that uh, public servants, they do not see themselves as an extension of the ruling party. And I always recall one phrase from one uh, from a series that that public service is always is in opposition to any political power. And because it is in opposition, therefore it doesn't represent a part of either of them, which means that basically that the public service or the civil service is sort of independent of any political party, be it ruling or opposition party. Now, for people to see the civil service as an independent arbiter, we need to do many things. One, to improve the legislative framework and probably change the uh, perception based on some positive precedents and public participation of people in the elections is is the second thing so if we if we sort of consolidate if we unite these two things then we will have better results and our election system today is based on the balance of powers so the different political parties are so much in conflict with each other that their conflict actually uh, preconditions uh, uh, the independence of uh, elections administration so that's how it should be and of course it has the grain of reason however it makes the system very heavy and therefore this balance of powers uh, in the elections commission uh, tends to support and work in favor of the ruling political party, especially at the lower levels of the elections administration or the commission. Therefore, there should be one uh, person who will be in charge of uh, the um, elections process. And of course, there should be relevant procedure for um, selection and appointment of such a person. There are two parts. One, how can we increase the trust of people uh, through certain procedures? And another is that the, the scope of actions for such a person should be quite restricted. So, as well as the discretion, the discretion of this person, etc. So, it should be quite a restricted uh, area for for this person to act. Uh, so. Why not? Well, we, we can, I think, have such a such a thing. Next, you know, to increase trust uh, locally, to do so, the people shall get involved in the most um, questioned part of elections, like counting ballots. If France manages to count ballots by people and if they can count ballots in one day and it is you know sort of counted before 8 p.m next day then why can't it be done here and next of course there are some technical mechanisms um, contemporary electronic um, devices or soft, etc., for exchange of information, etc., etc. But the main thing is that 
people who are randomly selected can participate in counting ballots and counting votes, and that may lead to increased trust in, uh, in, in counted votes in general, and it may increase uh, trust to elections in general. And in conclusion, I want to say that we need to see the trust in election scene dynamics to see how it changes in time. Uh, so, and we have to see it as a dynamic process in general. And therefore, we need to make certain adjustments and adaptations. So, my recommendation is that the, the, on the one hand, this elections commission shall be replaced by professionals and not how the balance of power, powers or political parties in the Central Election Commission. <clears throat> Thank you to all our speakers. We can move on to questions and answers. And before that, I must tell you. I interviewed a policy paper, every politics. Policy papers. The politics is the policy papers are uploaded. The policy papers that are prepared by Georgian Institute of Politics, and they concern the topics that we discussed today. This, uh, uh, we receive certain questions, and before that, I will ask a question which is quite general in nature. In Georgia, we generally have one question. So, is there any solution or not? Or not? And what is the solution? And there is trend in Georgia that that the situation improvement is usually linked to legislative changes. Levan and Jabba mentioned this issue partially, uh, lest it was mentioned by Julie and Ketevan. And um, we had some recommendations and proposals about the elections uh, commission, administration. So the question is, if we do it all, will it really qualitatively change the uh, elections administration and uh, what kind of legislative changes do we need to significantly uh, shift um, and change things in the elections to increase trust in it and uh, because we had these stages, you know, that we have to have semi-proportionate, uh, you know, now the fully proportionate elections, and that would be the final and ultimate solution and panacea, etc. I think there still are problems, etc. So, Levan and Jabba um, actually said that the, we need to change the Elections Commission and actually appoint professionals to it. And this idea was actually once uh, expressed and uh, it was supported by international organizations, but political parties somehow opposed to this idea because they said that, yes, of course, it sounds sort of good that we will have, you know, um, a person who will not belong and who will not be sort of linked to any political party, but they said nobody will believe it anyhow. So, so even if we experts believe that this person um, is neutral, then people won't believe it anyways. So ultimately, this idea and this proposal failed because it was conceded that this person will still be somebody who will just, um, you know, um, work for interests of the ruling party. 
and it's been said that such changes and such legal changes may be perceived, understood or interpreted differently anyhow. And that will not guarantee trust in elections. Um, actually, Well, maybe parties uh, actually observe what happens at the level of local polling stations, commission members, and not in the central level. But I don't know what is it. Uh, shall we find some sort of golden formula, or shall we do something else? Maybe just accumulate experience and gradually transform the uh, the election system. I mean, what should be the direction and the path? that we have to follow, what would be your preference to achieve some really, you know, significant, tangible results in a long term? Well, and before we start, the we organizers agreed that shorter would follow uh, the questions in the chat and he would read read out those questions for all of us. Thank you. There are two questions so fine, but they are both in English, so I will read them in English. I think it's, I think it will be. The first question is probably to all speakers, and it is from David Darciashvili. Institutional reasons. Uh, for election troubles in Georgia. Basically, it is about the amalgamation of economy and politics. Losing political power means in a way of losing income for living. Hence, no one wants to leave the power. But what do you, but what to do about the absence of civilizational choice within the society? Many post-Soviet countries lack essential societal cohesion. And we have the same problem in Georgia. Society is split uh, on fundamental issues. Even democracy is not unequivocally accepted as the best governance model. Do you think it also plays additional role for not having normal governmental change cycles through elections? That was the first question. And the second question is to Ms. Bokwadze and uh, Professor George. Uh, thanks for interesting input uh, you all provided. I just wanted to clear things up regarding election legitimacy issue as such. What precisely has to happen to question, undermine the results of the election, particularly in case of Georgia's 2020 parliamentary election? Based on your extensive experience, uh, could you please elaborate more on this uh, using the other countries' examples, maybe? What would be the line when citizens blow the whistle legitimately? While opposition operates within partisan purposes, international reputable observing missions have recognized this election mostly fair. That's what uh, prerequisites are needed to cl classify election as non-legitimate. So we have two ways of facilitating so we can really uh, pass floor to speakers and i would ask actually you know to use the conservative approach and ask to answer questions in the sequence or the order that we had speakers first so maybe julie would start uh, answering questions so please so thank you so much um I'm going to start with the second question first, because I think that picks up on some of the questions that uh, Batono Gia was uh, reflecting on at the end of everyone's presentation. And this is, you know, what what next? How do you build the trust, um, especially uh, maybe there are elite level things or political leader things that can happen, but that doesn't necessarily instill uh, the um, the trust in the system from the population. I think this picks up on um, what Jabba and, and Levon were discussing to, to a large degree. I, I think the issue is actually not legislative. I mean, probably there are legislative issues, uh, but I, I, from where I sit, it's an enforcement. Um, it's in uh, some kind of disinterested, somebody who's disinterested in the outcome to actually regulate and enforce concerns or considerations. 
and do it in a transparent way that is evidence-based, that is publicized, um, that is clear to everybody. Uh, I think it's very hard to build trust um, without showcasing the process through which that trust is earned. And uh, I think that process of showcasing is very important. It, and it will not, I mean, the thing about democracies is it's, it's always going to fail um, in a way uh, because there are people who value democracy for dem democracy's sake. And then there are people who value democracy only when they get to win, uh, which I think is, is picking up on, on David's point um, in his question, right? And if you only value democracy when you get to win, which is incidentally a conversation that's happening in the United States of America, right, like right now, um, then your, your valuation of democracy is always mitigated. It's always limited and it's always circumstantial and linked to outcomes. That's the nature of democracy. It's a competitive process. And I think that seeking popular unity uh, around this idea that everyone's gonna agree that democracy is going to be the best way is, 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 is not an endeavor that is going to build success. Uh, so given that, if that's the reality, then you set that aside and say, okay, we understand that people are going to distrust the system. Let us earn that trust and showcase it um, for as many people as we possibly can. And the answer to that is in the courts. It's not in legislation. Um, I think changing institutions, um, you know, the switch to a PR system in Georgia, I always thought was very interesting, but also problematic because you don't have real political party development in Georgia around ideals. A very few parties can develop that kind of structure. And that is a system that the proportional representation system, that, that is the, the thing that drives a proportional representation system. So absent of that, it's all about gaming who gets to win. That's why you have the institutional shifts. And if people observe that, you can change the institutions whenever you want, as long as you get to win, then that dismantles the trust in the system. So rather than doing anything legislatively, I think transparency, opinion-based, evidence-based in the courts that is as publicized as possible is really the only way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Julie and Ketevan. Right. I'll uh, try to merge my merge the, the questions. And uh, as Julie mentioned, I think they sort of build up on each other. So um, I'll start with with uh, Professor Nodia's uh, question and whether it's you know matter of political culture or is it more legislative solutions, right? And I think it's it's partially both, right? Because on the one hand, I think that it, what, when we talk about political culture, it's maybe about you know uh, it's a matter of time i think and if again if parties realize that they they will stay in the game over the long haul uh they start to appreciate some of the uh, some of the independent institutions and depoliticized institutions i remember when unm lost power some of its leaders started very proactively talking about the need to insulate courts right so they started to value what's earlier, maybe they were not um, valuing so much. Uh, but at the same time, it of course should be uh, accompanied by changes at the institutional level, including at the legislative level, what both Levan and Jabba uh, described. And I think it's it's incredibly important to, to insulate um, bureaucrats from uh, political infringements, something that we see right now a lot, insulate courts. Again, we're going back to this, uh, this issue. So, short answer to long question would be, I think it's a matter of both. And regarding a question about the legitimacy of elections and, you know, how, like fairness of elections, I think basically we should talk about uh, fairness of elections in terms of three institutions, right? Whether um, dominant party abuses administrative resources, which is essentially bureaucracy, abuses media and abuses courts, right? And I think if we see less of abuse of these institutions, so then we can actually talk about the, not just free elections, but also fair elections. Um, yeah, of course, uh, administra abuse of administrative resources happens also in, in democracies and something that we need to, you know, we've seen both in the US and some of the, the European states, but of course they are not as disproportionate to just really undermine uh, chances of opposition to to win uh, to win power yeah i think that would be my answer to that thank you 
Levan, if you'd like, yes. Probably I would respond to your uh, speech or your sentiment, so to say. I think that, of course, legislative technical changes uh, uh, separately may not bring us to the um, desired outcomes. Political culture, political development is absolutely necessary. In our conferences and in many different formats, we've discussed it and we talked about the consensus in public attitudes, etc. So, of course, at the normative level, things shall change. Although changes like structural um, changes of the Elections Commission, etc., you know, without such changes, it will be very difficult to achieve something. And of course, there will be many people opposing to it uh, who would who would disagree with such proposals. And we'll have this disagreement coming from various, um, say, ruling parties and opposition parties, people, etc. However, you know, uh, political parties have their benefits from having their representatives in the Central Election Commission, and that is important. I think it will not be the overstatement if we say that there are political parties who exist only for these benefits and based on these benefits. And of course, uh, if we start the more drastic reform, because the reform that we uh, see today, it is somehow the attempt of adjusting the older system to new realities, because we have new actors in the politics, and let's adjust and adopt it to this new place, etc. And yes, it is important, because the political landscape changes, and it requires certain changes, but it is not a drastic, uh, you know, uh, reform. Uh, so it's just the attempt of refining and fine tuning the system. I agree with what Jabba said, uh, Getty, that uh, the public service reform and its separation and its installation, as Katie said, from the politics is absolutely, absolutely crucial. Maybe we are at the level of development where political parties bring their supporters to public services. And maybe somebody may say that the next stage of development will be when we will have, um, you know, non-partisan public servants, etc. But I think uh, we need to discuss it more and probably promote this idea that we need, you know, really, really neutral stuff in the public service. Now, Jabba, please. Continue Levan's idea. I would say that uh, such civil services, uh, they existed earlier as well, and they are not, uh, are not something new. There was the stage where, you know, uh, public, professional public servants were required um, and not, you know, pro-partisan servants. Somehow we've skipped this stage altogether, and uh, this is what differentiates us from um, uh, from countries of uh, Eastern Europe, for instance. As to Gia's question, the, the legislative reform and normative reform will resolve the issue. Of course, it will not. It's just that we need to see and to uh, push towards the, uh, the transformative processes. Uh, of the society and transformation of law, and they are interlinked. And our first instinct is such that we, first of all, try to change laws, but I don't think uh, it is not uh, 
completely right. However, I think that the law that we currently have definitely requires revision and changes. I don't think that the most important issue is how the Central Elections Commission or the administration, how it will change. But, uh, but the most important thing is to really increase and change the perception of people and trust in election processes that affect those people in general. So the structure of incentives that currently exists is not sufficient for parliamentary elections, for instance, and it's not the same incentive as would exist say, in the conditions of regional or local elections. And therefore, I think we need to increase trust towards the elections in general from, you know, it, it shall be coming from grassroots, from the down level stop. But thank you. Now we have little time left for one more round of questions and answers. I myself have a question, but I think we have a question here in the Q&A too. Um, there is the topic that uh, you panelists didn't really touch upon, except for Katie, uh, centrality of Europe and Western influences. We have welcomed this mediation, and I can only recall Levan Masadze, who really opposed this mediation of, uh, of, of Europe. Uh, well, I want to ask you, do you see the problematic component in it? because we found ourselves in, in an environment and circumstances where the EU has taken sort of guardianship uh, over our democracy. So we found ourselves first in a deadlock, and if Michel did not arrive, we would have not seen the light in the end of the tunnel, sort of. So, And I know that the um, the largest opposition party did not yet decide to go and uh, take their seats in the parliaments. And although you know there are the leadership of the party really thinks that they have to take their seats in the parliament, but they are still trying to somehow agree sort of these processes and uh, uh, achieve consent inside the party. So we see then the European mediators at the level of elite, they may, um, you know, lead to some solutions and to help with solutions. But when the problem is very deep, then um, uh, it may not be, uh, it may not be the way or the method to achieve solutions at all levels, etc. And also there can be players that can be interested or maybe interested in, uh, you know, blurring the results or somehow, you know, concealing those, uh, diminishing, etc. So my question is, what do you think about efficacy of the mediation, the results and outcomes of that. So, because it may lead us to some results and it may not lead to others or may it may have some negative effect in your opinion. So what could you say about that? And again, I want to turn to shorter and uh, I think there are some more questions in the q a yes indeed we have questions that basically repeat your question about the mediation of eu and america and uh, whether george and is it possible to find solutions in the local georgian context again with regards to elections and what can be the role of the civil society or the public in all of it uh see 
we have very little time and we have a participant who has their hand raised and that will be the last question. So please ask this question. Hello. Araman Beritsa. Thank you very much for the interesting insights. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so um, I'm Karaman Berize, the student of International Security Management at Berlin School of Economic and Law. Uh, so as regards my question, um, generally we all agree that the election was problematic. Uh, but when it comes to the recognition of the election by Western institutions, including the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, and the leaders of the state who congratulate our government on the successful election. I was wondering if it is the right to boycott the election and uh, cause the six months crisis, and um, this has to some extent destroyed the image of democratic institutions in the eyes of the West of our country. And um, is it possible to find behind this crisis special, for example, pro-Russian forces that want to show the West that Georgia is still far from you, and that, that, that way destroy their trust towards Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Didi Madloba. All right, then I would go from, you know, like backwards. And please try to be very brief in answering these questions, uh, just at the level of CVs, and that's all. So I will give floor to Jabba first. I will say about mediation first. I think that with such, you know, res resolving political crisis with such mediation is not, uh, is not desirable, it's not good, of course, but why did we need it at all? And we needed it because we needed to compensate for the weak link that exists between the voters and the government. The ruling party actually doesn't talk to voters, doesn't think that it should talk to, uh, to the people because they are accountable only be before their patron, and that's all. And therefore, they do not, they, they sort of violate the limits of the democratic systems. And actually, this was spontaneous uh, proposal of Jean, Jean Michel uh, to start with this mediation because these traditional methods, they didn't work. And to answer, Mr. Lanskoy, very quickly. In the past, we had this method of so called boomerang, uh, where the people had the sort of the interaction with the international uh, society, and there was sort of indirect pressure on the government of the ruling party who influenced its voters and the international society. This system functions currently only partially and the ruling party demonstrated many times that they do not believe in indirect messages and uh, uh, they believe only in direct involvement, direct messages, indirect uh, influences. So I think uh, uh, that that is quite obvious. And what is the solution to that? I, I think the, today's format will not be sufficient to, to, to discuss this issue. Uh, there was the question about uh, the Russian influences, uh, the pro-Russian person. And of course, Russia tries to uh, interfere everywhere it can. And uh, of course, they would try to um, to to uh, spread misinformation and disinformation. Uh, however, our systems are quite weak uh, so far, and the response is weak uh, so far. And uh, we mentioned it is different researches and the reports of the civil society as to mediation. Well, of course. I agree with Jabba 
Putin said that Kosa mediation is not desirable and it's not the best solution ever, of course. Uh, it would have been much better if uh, political parties in Georgia found the common tongue amongst themselves. And of course, there was question, why couldn't they do it? You know, why could they find the common grounds, the common language to speak, etc.? Uh, it's, you know, how many people are there not to find uh, the, this uh, uh, common language? And they, we, we actually had these quite interesting answers to these questions when asked that. And some of them said that maybe because, you know, we can't find the common grounds because we're not punished uh, sufficiently. So political parties should understand that uh, you know, separating and dividing a society would create problems to themselves during the elections. The ruling party, as well as the opposition, they have to compromise and to compromise on things that their voters wouldn't even imagine that these parties would compromise after election. So probably and hopefully it is a very good lesson for political parties, be it ruling party or the opposition party. Um, so, uh, you know, division, bringing these people to almost civil confrontation and then reconciliation is not really a good thing and it's not a good path to follow. Thank you, Ketevan now. Very briefly as well. Um, I do agree that it does, international mediation creates the problem of, of legitimacy. Why should Georgia citizens accept deals that have been mediated by external forces? Of course. However, at this point, I completely agree with both Jabba and Levin that this is very much needed. And I think uh, EU should continue not just mediation, but even applying some of the measures of conditionality because conditionality is a powerful instrument. And again, looking at some of the countries that were in a very similar position in Central and Eastern Europe that ended up at a different stage right now, I think uh, is something that we should look with hope. So yeah, of course, may, civil society should be more active, but at this point, I would say conditionality is should also continue. And Julie, you have the last word of wisdom. Thank you so much. I, I'm not sure how wise it will be, but um, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I think the you know, to answer um, Miriam's question, I think the US and the EU should continue to value Georgia as a Western partner, as a European partner. Uh, and I think to the extent that they can help develop with neutrality, um, a, a, an equilibrium of supply and demand of real democratic outcomes, I think that commitment should be longstanding, firm and secure and consistent. Um, I don't think this right now is any time to change uh, that investment into Georgia's future. I think, in fact, it's now time to double down on it and extend it um, with, with real commitment. I think the answer comes, of course, in, inevitably from Georgia. The human capital in Georgia is extraordinary. The, the domestic demand for, de for democracy is pronounced. Um, and I think the people need to have higher expectations of their government and demand transparency. Uh, and that's a long standing process. And I think it's one that we're watching. I um, mean, it makes us nervous, but it also makes me very excited. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. I think we had a very interesting conversation. And uh, And uh, it is absolutely obvious that we are absolutely pro-Western, at least these people of experts, and we definitely uh, see positively involvement of our Western partners in our political processes. And secondly, to finish on, uh, optimistically, I'd say that uh, we cannot very often achieve some very distinct positive uh, outcomes, but we won't give up. We'll continue being optimists 
uh, will continue struggling. And finally, finally, we hope that ultimately we will find a solution and we'll be much better off. And we will have a good, strong democracy that will ensure freedom of the society and development of the country. Thank you all very much once again. And we await you here again on uh, 2nd of June at uh, five o'clock, and we will talk about the service and why don't we trust them. Thank you once again. Goodbye, and I wish you a nice, very nice evening. Bye.